so, so I, I guess we'll figure out whether uh, <clears throat> we want to co cover a search engines or do clustering or uh, right or recommenders. We'll figure this out. Okay. So everybody remembers um, Knivebase. Any quick two sentence summary of Knivebase? Remember, I always promise lunches and dinners. Actually, I haven't found too many people getting lunches and dinners because I guess I haven't been asking you about them, right? Uh, so, not in recent past. Okay, knife base. What is knife base? Okay, first of all, any uh, discriminant approach to classification. And knife base is an approach, right? What is the method or what's the key idea of uh, any of these classification methods? Any answers? Especially those of you who have done machine learning already? Say that again? It's like finishing all the points in a sample with the same brush. So then most of them are nailed, therefore I think they're more than nailed. As being what? As being whatever most of them are. Oh, okay. okay. No, no, okay. That, that's a naive model. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Naive base is the method I taught last time. Oh, yeah. Right? That's the naive uh, approach. What is naive base? Yeah? The Bayesian model is assuming independence. So. Yeah. You assume that these features, uh, given the class, you're assuming that the features are independent, right? And then you classify based on the assumption of independence, correct? So, so let me go back to remind you of the basic expressions uh, and tell you, uh, let's see here, go back all the way. So everything, remember this is the, uh, let's see, let's go back to live base first. Remember we said, first of all, any classifier, Let's remember a classifier, right? If you've got a class which is your term positive, could be a one, zero, positive, one or positive, and you look at another class which is zero or negative, right? And E is a data point which gives you the features of the data point, right? So you sort of say, look, if I look at the probability that given this data, I think it's likely to be this particular class which is positive, and divide that by the probability that it's going to be the negative class, right? If the ratio is greater than one, then you say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to guess it's plus, right? If it's less than one, then you say, hey, it's negative, right? So I'm choosing, so I've got two scores. I look at the, uh, the ratio of the two scores. And one score is higher, then I plunk for that class, and the score corresponds to a class, right? I've got two classes. So I have a data point E. I have to figure out this data point E, which is a set of features, right? X1, X2, Xn. Do I put this data point and label it with class plus or class minus? So I get a score. In this case, it's a probability, conditional probability. Let's say, look, let me look at the ratio of the scores. If the ratio is greater than 1, I plunk for plus. If it's less than 1, I plunk for minus. That's the basic idea of classification here, right? Right? Everybody with me? OK. Uh, I hope you're solving your assignments. Uh, I'm not sure I assign one on this, right? Because often, just assignments help you remember the idea. OK. Now, the other one is, uh, we said that, well, if I look at any data point, E is a data point, right? X1, X2, Xn, correct? So I'm assuming that if I know the class, then the feature values are independent. So the value of your height, I'm assuming, is independent of your weight, if I know you're a boy or a girl. Now, of course, the two are related, but that's the assumption, I'm, approximation I'm making. So the question, of course, is, if you think of this naive base type of classifier, uh, in other words, if I use the model, look, look on top, right? I've got the probability of C equals plus given E, right? But down below, I have an expression for it which assumes that all these factor off, right? So if I use the classifier, the top is a classifier of any type, but I assume it's a naive base model, if you will. I call, I call it a naive base uh, classifier, right? Everybody with me? Okay. So now, why is this possibly wrong? Any takers? If I have a naive base model, is it a good model? If I make this, mo uh, assume, if height and weight. I'm assuming if x1 and x2 only have two variables, right? I'm assuming if you're a man, your height and weight, the probability of your height being something, your weight being something else, are independent. Uh -huh. so you, you have someone who's really tall, then they're likely going to be weighing more as opposed to someone who's really short. 
Exactly, right? Good, you've been reading your stuff and thinking about it, good. Uh, so, so it sort of seems it may not be a good approximation, right? However, it's one of the most popular classifiers uh, in text mining. So you say, hey, this doesn't look quite right, but by golly, it works well. Right? That's the, many times, uh, especially in computer science, right, you try out something, it works, and then you try to figure out why it works, right? So this is one good uh, situation. So what we went through last class is why does it work when it's not supposed to work? Remember that? That's, so I want to recap last class. Hopefully it's put up on the webcast. If anyone's missed class, go look that up. But you're trying to figure out why does it work when it's not supposed to work? Okay, so now we'll give you an example. So I'm skipping all that. So just remember the definition of your classifier, right? FBE. So let's go back all the way now. So we went through all that last time. So let's look at the, okay. So the intuition of what we showed you last time is, although you can have, there are three choices, right? One, if I've got multiple features, it may be that they're truly independent, right? In other words, your income may, could be potentially unrelated to your weight, right? Because why is that? Because you, one assumption is, hey, if you have more money, you eat more, because you can afford to eat more. Well, of course, uh, in these parts of California, probably if you're more affluent, you cut back and diet so that your weight is not that great anyway. Right? If you're in, I don't know, I was just talking to somebody from Nigeria or India, maybe you're from a poorer region, you tend not to eat much your lean and mean. Here, you start exercising your lean and mean. So this may cancel off, so it's a reasonable approximation, right? The, however, another possibility is I've got a bunch of variables, but the impact of those either on the positive class or the negative class, just cancel, they all cancel out. And that's really what we looked at last time, right? And that's where naive Bayes might work. So you have two classes. All these variables interact in influencing each class. But the, roughly speaking, the, the impact is the same, so they cancel off. That's what the upshot of all the discussion last time was, right? OK, now, so this is the summary, right? That uh, if all the dependencies amongst the attributes cancel out, then the classifier is still optimal or approximately optimal, even though, hey, the dependencies are there, and that's not a reasonable model, but the re approximation works. Okay. Now, let's, we're going to look at an example along the basis. Now, I've got uh, data point E at x1, x2, right? E is an instance of a data point, right? It's got two components, x1, x2. And um, I look at the positive class, right? So think of all these data points. So they have some particular, uh, all of you familiar with Gaussian random variables? So if I look at this expression for the first one, it says that if I belong to the positive class, then all the data points x correspond to having this distribution where the mean is mu plus and the variance, uh, 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 right, is a sigma plus. Right? Everybody with me? And remember when I say x, x has got two components, x1 and x2. Everybody with me? So, and similarly, if I look at x1 and x2 minus, then it's exactly the same expression, but the mean, instead of being mu plus, is mu minus, and the variance is, or the covariance matrix is uh, sigma, uh, sigma uh, minus inverse. Everything fine? Yeah. What's mu, mu, plus mu plus is the mean corresponding to the positive category plus. We have two classes or categories. So, so th think about it. If the data points from the first category, right? are essentially looking like this. So think about uh, easiest ways. Let's assume I think of plus. Uh, think of minus and plus. So me, maybe I've got a distribution where the mean is mu minus, okay. and I've got another distribution where the mean is mu plus. Oh, right? There are two different distributions. Yeah. Right? So we're trying to figure out if I see a data point, so, but maybe it doesn't go off like this. Maybe it goes like this. Maybe this comes like this, right? So the two distributions can overlap, right? Ah, by the way, here's the Santa Cruz contingent. They're coming in a bit. Uh, does anybody need any park coins for parking? I have a supply of coins. You're okay? Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, so, so, so basically, we've got two distributions, right? This is the plus, and this is the, uh, sorry, this is the minus, and this is the plus category, right? And we're trying to figure out, when I see a point, see, there could be points which could belong to either of them. And I'm trying to figure out which, this point, does it belong here, does it belong there? That's the classification, right? By the way, that is what classification is. Now, I'm showing you 
distributions in one dimensional space, right? But in n dimensional space, every feature value can be different. And I've just got two distributions, and the whole classification issue is is it this or that? And the reason we need to disambiguate it is a point could often be either this or that. We can only say it's more likely to be this or that. So we'll always make, have some errors when we classify. Everybody with me? That's the fundamental classification problem. So now, uh, so, so going back to this, so if I'm now in the left-hand side, which is minus, for that, the distribution has uh, mu, the mean is mu minus. And the variance could also be different, right? Out of covariance, because it's got two terms, x1, x2. So remember, this is two-dimensional. This picture I drew is one-dimensional, right? Everybody with me now? OK. So, so what we're going to show is, let me tell you uh, what we're going to see. So when you look at all these ratios, we'll see that if we use naive base, life becomes much easier, which is what you'd expect. And that's why we use naive base, right? We'll, we'll just see that. Hmm. OK. OK? Everybody clear about this? So this is just the model, right? Want to take a look? So am I repeating everything again? Anybody having any difficulty? Looks good? Okay? Okay. Now, so let's assume we have two classes. Let's assume in this particular case that both of them have a similar or common covariance matrix. That's an assumption, right? It may not be the case. But sometimes you make these assumptions to make life easy for ourselves. So now also we assume that x1 and x2 have the same variance, sigma in both each of the classes, right? Same variance. So now, remember FB, our classifier? We look at the uh, probability. The classifier always says, hey, let me look at these two scores. Look at the probability that data point x1, x2 belongs to the positive class plus, And I have an expression for it. And I look at the probability that uh, the same data point x1, x2 belongs to the class minus, And I've got some other probability for it. And I look at the two ratios. And I take the log of both those, right? And that's this expression. Right? I've got two, the ratio of two different uh, uh, Gaussian uh, or normal distributions, right? So I cancel off some terms, and I come up with this, correct? So you want to digest it for a moment? Do you see any uh, terms canceling off? Let's look at what we had before, and let's see previously, and let's see what we have now. If you look at this term, I've got x into sigma inverse x into x, uh, x transpose sigma plus inverse into x here, right? But in the new expression, there are no terms uh, which involve uh, x transpose and x. You see that? Because this cancels off. If you assume sigma plus inverse and sigma minus inverse are equal, then those terms cancel off, right? Yeah? So, so sometimes you think, I think it's better to work through the algebra. But these days of PowerPoint, I guess we just hit the highlights, right? OK. So if you do all the algebra, you come up with this expression, which has some constant term. And sigma squared is x1 and x2 have the same variance sigma, sigma squared. So you have that. Now sigma inverse uh, minus, uh, sigma minus inverse and sigma plus inverse are the same, sigma inverse. And then I've got this other linear term, right? So I've got two terms, a constant and something linear in the x's, right? This x contains x1 and x2 both. So far, so good? OK, so you can work out the algebra, but this is, and this time I checked it, I don't know, a year ago. I haven't checked the algebra, but I'm assuming it hasn't changed. OK. Now, when we look at the naive base, right, what happens is when you look at sigma, you assume that sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, uh, uh, this should be 2, 1, right? Sorry. Uh, and, but the two are equal, it's symmetric are 0, right, in naive base, because we assume there's no dependency. Right? Whereas here, we do have a dependency. Do you see the difference? 
So this is the regular classifier. And we'll see when we approximate it. In the approximation, we set this equal to 0. Right? So far, so good. No problem. Sigma inverse has this expression. Oh, sigma 1, 2 is the, well, if you look at uh, variance and covariance, I've got two random variables. Uh, all of you familiar with variance and covariance? Yes? No? Forgotten? Okay. So let's just all remember. Uh, everybody remembers uh, what is variance. Uh, if I've got expectation of x minus uh, well, you can call it either expected value of, which is expected value of x, right? Square. What is this called? Variance. Or is actually sigma of variance, right? Now, if I've got x1 minus x1 bar times x2 minus x2 bar, expected value of that, what is this called? Right? Uh, okay? Yeah. Everybody with me? Okay. So, uh, yeah, we, so we have expressions for this, right? So now, if I have naive base, uh, right, notice there's only x1 and x2. There's no uh, x1 squared, x1, x2, x2 squared, which we would have had in the original uh, classifier when actually all uh, we knew that the variables were not being treated independently, but the dependencies were accounted for, right? So this is a naive base, but this is the more complicated classifier. So when we go through all the algebra, right? So again, x1 and x2 are independent only if sigma 1, 2 equals 0. Otherwise, we have this. So, uh, so we said that the classifier fp, remember, if it's positive, it's actually 1, not Last time we had this discussion in class, not 0, but 1, right? If this is 1, then we are saying that this is uh, plus and not minus, right? Now, instead of, uh, but in FB, sigma 1, 2 and sigma uh, is not 0. Whereas in naive base, you set sigma 1, 2 equal to 0, right? And so, so anyway, so dividing by constants does not change your classifier, right? Uh, okay. So if you now compare the, the original classifier, it's a bit of a messy expression, right? If you look at this one. But in the original classifier also, we notice that the x1, x, uh, x1 squared, x1, x2 terms are missing. Why is that? First of all, in this, we said naive base, it's not surprising they're missing. But why are the x1, x2 terms, or x1 squared, x2 squared terms missing in the regular classifier? Anyone who gives me an answer gets lunch. You don't care what sign it is in the product? Uh, you don't care what is which sign. What F, which sign? Uh, sorry, you don't care whether F B is greater or less than zero. No, that is true. That is true. But how come I don't see those terms at all? Because you see, this second term F what is F B? F B X one X two comes from the, the, the following expression, right? Uh, let me write it out because sometimes it's helpful to write these things out. Okay, these are the two crucial things which we should remember. Okay, always remember this. Let's, uh, so let's keep this in mind. I think what I like is having four projectors with four document cameras, so I get the equivalent of a, of a whiteboard, because often just having all the whole whiteboard, you can see all the ideas being developed. The changing uh, PowerPoints is not a great way of uh, learning, I think. Excuse me. So uh, FB... Right, the classifier we had for a data point. E is what? What is the data point E? It is x1, let's make it easy, x1, x2 is the data point, right? So if I look at this data point E, and I'm trying to classify it, uh, then I'm going to say that this is a probability of the fact that the class is positive given this data point E, divided by the probability that C is, the class is negative given the same data point, if the ratio is greater than or equal to 1, then I will say that the class is positive, right? Implies C is plus, right? That's, that's the classifier. Now, 
so we also have said that if I have naive base model, then probability that uh, any given any data point x1, x2, right, conditional on the class, and c could be plus or minus, or minus, this can factor off nicely as, uh, I'll make it simple, it's just probability of x1 given the class c, which could be positive or negative, times the same class, x2 given c is either positive or negative. Everybody with me? That's the basic model we have. Now, one other expression we need is, if I look at the, uh, okay, we are also saying that this particular uh, probability that we are writing down here, if I think of probability of x1, when the class is plus, right? This is given by 1 by 2 pi, uh, what is the terminology? Uh, yeah, sigma plus square root, right, to the power of half into the usual Gaussian expression, e to the power, times e to the power of minus 1 by 2 sigma squared, uh, what is it? Oh, sorry, uh, that's because I have a matrix now. I have x1 and x2, right? Half x uh, minus mu plus transpose into sigma plus inverse into x minus mu plus. Have everybody agrees with me? So now all I'm asking is, so if I look at this expression, it's got x transpose into x. So somehow you have x1 and x is x1, x2, right? This x is really x1, x2, right? So I should somehow have terms which involve both x1 and x2, and, and the square of these things, right? But somehow when I apparently, when I work all this out, when I work all this out, I'm getting the fact that my classifier, this thing here, which is really this ratio, with for this expression and this expression, I'm substituting expressions like this, which involve quadratic terms in x1 and x2. But what remains has no quadratic terms in x1 and x2. So can anybody tell me, everybody first clear what the problem is? We have two distributions and we're looking at the ratio. If the ratio is greater than one, we classify and say this is positive. Now, each of those expressions on top and bottom has got x squared terms, x1, x2, x1 squared, x1, x2, x2 squared terms. But here, apparently, those cross terms don't exist. I only have x1 and or x2 separately, but not the two terms mixed up together or squared. So anyone who can tell me why gets lunch? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So, so we can take so because you, if oh, because if I have a certain if think of top and bottom, right? If one is larger than the other, then if I take the log, the property is not going to change. So the log is monotone. If I have an x value, log x is monotone. That means if x increases, log x will increase. So the basic ratio being greater than one. So by the way, maybe that's a confusion. In some of those expressions, when you say greater than or equal to zero, if you take a log, you use zero. You don't take a log, you use one. That was the Confusion that kept occurring. Okay. That's right. You assume they share the same covariance. Okay, correct. And then. Okay. So what he's saying is, when I look at the top and bottom, I've got terms like x transpose sigma inverse x plus inverse x. So I have some terms which look like x transpose sigma plus inverse. Uh, and x, x, right, e to the power of something, divided by e to the power of minus something, d by e to the power of x transpose sigma minus inverse x, terms like this, right? But if s these two, sigma plus and sigma minus, are equal to sigma, then these terms cancel off. Cancel them off. See that? And so the assumption that these two uh, covariance are identical is critical to cancelling out those terms. Everybody with me? So now, what do you get? Well, if those terms cancel off, you only have linear terms. You have something which is linear in x1 and x2, 
which says, hey, this function, if it is greater than some 1 or 0 or whatever you choose to be, uh, 0 in this case because you're taking logs, right? So we have some term, where we have an expression of this type. Can I get rid of this again? Can I erase everything? Uh, no, l l let me keep this. But let's assume, so we have an expression. And we are saying the following. I've got data points. So what we're saying is, I've got data points a1, x1, plus a2, x2, plus some uh, constant b. We're saying this greater than or equal to zero. So every time this is greater than or equal to zero, I'm going to call this implies that it belongs to plus. So in other words, if I draw a picture here, I draw x1, I draw x2, and I draw a line like this. So this region corresponds to uh, a1 plus x1, a2 plus 2 be, being greater than zero. Right? This is this region. So then I'll always label these positive. If, they, if this condition is not satisfied, all the other points, I'll call them negative. So I've, I've broken up the whole region into two pieces. One piece, which is described by this equation, which is described by this, being positive, and the other region when the same expression is negative, right? like two scoring functions. So all data points are just separated out. right? Everybody with me? No problems? Wide awake? Interesting? Yeah? Okay. Now, so now we also know if you do naive base, if you look at these expressions, you've got terms like sigma 1, 2. But in naive base, we assume sigma 1, 2, 0, because we're assuming that the random variables are independent. So that means these terms go away, and we have a simpler expression here in naive base. Right? So they're both classifiers. They're both linear in x1 and x2. But naive Bayes has a different expression compared to this one. Everybody fine so far? So now you can see why naive Bayes may still work, right? Any doubts, questions? Fine. Have any of you learned naive Bayes now in machine learning? No, no, yes, now you learned it. But did you learn it previously in machine learning? You did? Did you do all this? No. They just said, he has knife base. God told you it's true. Go believe it. But now you know for yourselves. You also know when it might work, when it might not work. Right? But there's one difference. I guess you always need to learn things at one level of simplicity and then move to the next level of simplicity. Right? OK. So, so by the way, this A, of course, that constant we wrote down there is some mess. Right? That's fine. We don't care. So now. Remember, we, we factored the original expression. We had to classify it into two pieces, the naive base piece and what is left over, right? If the product of those is greater than or equal to 0, and this is a log version, right? Then we know, hey, uh, the two, there's no difference between the two, right? Because in other words, if the classification, this is the original classifier. So if this gives you the, the same region as removing this and having only naive base, right? So if I remove this piece, which is a mess, remember? You look at this mess. So if the product is, the true classification depends on this product being greater than 0. If this is 0, I call it plus. Otherwise, I'll label it minus. But if I could forget this piece, then I, I conceal this piece. This is a knife base piece. So I somehow ask the question, under what conditions will the classification, when I forget or omit that first term, and I chop up the uh, space into two regions, when is the classification the same? as including it, right? That's what I care about. Well, let's see what these regions look like. So if you look at this, right? Well, you have this whole mess, the whole region, right? So now, if we make some more assumptions, right, that the difference between the positives and negatives of both components is the same, I mean, these are all assumptions which may or may not be valid. Then the expression, I, I think there's something wrong there, I think. I'm not sure it's quadratic. Anyway, this, uh, the expressions simplify into getting some coefficients, right? Uh, I think that must be, I wonder if it's square or is the x1 minus x2. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, but uh, the, so essentially, you get a condition under which the two are the same, right? You want some condition under which naive base functions the same way as the more complicated expression. So as an example, uh, yeah, you have one of the lines, right? Uh, you have a line which characterizes the space or region where the classification is the same, right? 
and all those you'll be making errors. Right? So in that region, uh, there's something a little not quite right, but the concept is right, but there's something a little wrong with the slide. But there is some region where both classifiers are the same. Other parts, classifier is not the same, so you're making a mistake. But if the space when they're the same is large enough, then knife base is fine. Okay, everybody with me? So here's a problem, finally. We always like to see problems to see whether this helps you, right? So this is an interesting problem of credit cards. So uh, you remember the old bank problem we looked at? So we've got whether you, somebody's going to accept your deal. You're going to push in a product, like a, uh, something I think an insurance product for the poor unwary customer, right? And you're trying to figure out who's the willing victim or the, right, or the sweet sucker who's going to buy your stuff, right? So basically, you look at parameters such as, do they have a credit card or not? And uh, zero, one is, if they, zero means they did not accept the personal loan offer you made them. One means they accepted it, right? And then do they use online accounts? So you're looking at all these features, right? Do they have a credit card or not, right? So really you're asking, you have uh, three variables. Did they accept or not accept a personal loan? Do they have a credit card or not? Do they use online accounts or not? And you want to get a dependency, right? So you have all the data, right? You know how many people decide. This says, this one says credit card is zero. That means no credit card. This says people took a loan. And here in this line, if you use zero, it says, you know what? This person, 71 people did not have a credit card because of zero, took a loan, which is one, and did, have an, uh, did not have an online account because this is zero. Right? So every data point is zero or one. A zero for personal means personal loan means did not take loan. One means took a loan. Uh, one for CC means credit card. They did have a credit card, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So you chop up the whole space. So we have this data. So for us, I think what we're trying to find out is we're, we're really trying to figure out can we predict based on all this information in future what sort of function is it uh, when we can predict depending on their having a credit card and uh, not having an online account, each of those conditions, right? How likely are they to accept the loan? Now, the way to do it is you're simply Bayesian. You say, you know what? If I Look at the expression we have here. Uh, on top, I've got uh, the probability that a credit card is one divided by, uh, and I'm online. And I look at this acceptance. All of you remember Bayes' theorem, right? So Bayes' theorem is telling you, uh, so if I want to find out, my interest is, what is the probability of accept equals one? That's what I want to predict, right? What do I know? Given the fact, credit card equals one. Say I know that. And then online equals one. That means I know some customer uh, has an online account and uh, has a credit card. Then I want to predict, will this person accept my loan offer? So now, all of you know Bayes' theorem? So this expression here is really just a Bayes' expression, right? Everybody with me? Anyone who doesn't know Bayes' theorem? You don't know Bayes' theorem? Aha. Uh, let's see. We're at 10 to uh, 3. Let's do one thing. Then hold off and talk to me right after class, because that's a little fundamental, so it'll take a while, I think. OK. But Bayes' theorem, which is sort of relatively simple, is uh, if I've got probability of some event A conditional on B, Right? This is equal to probability of B given A times probability of A divided by probability of B. That's a simple base theorem. So here, this event B is two events, B and C together. Right? So this is a compound event called C and D. So that means you can write this as probability of A given C and D is equal to probability of C and D given A divided by probability of, uh, what is it now? And D into probability of A divided by probability of C and D, right? And our goal is to estimate A is the probability of accepting. C and D is that I have a credit card and that I'm, I have an online account. So that's why I use that expression, and that's the expression I've got here. Right? 
Everybody with me? So now I have all the data, right? I can fit it in. Now, the only problem is, in order to compute this, I need to know each of these terms. That I have a credit card, I'm online, I have a credit card, I'm on, but I, I online when I did not accept, all these alternative choices need to be known to me. There's a lot of choices. So let's say we've got 10 feature vectors, right? Say one or zero. I have two to the power of 10 variables. That becomes impossible. So that's why we use knife base because there's so many choices that computing the probability becomes a mess. So if I can say, you know, I have 10 choices, but I can treat them independently, it's a much easier thing to do, right? I can, because if I take a probability function, if I can say I've got 10 variables, p, x1, x2, up to x10. If I can somehow say it's probability of x1, probability of x2, and so on, product of all these up to probability of x10, right? It's just a simple uh, multiplication of simple things. But this itself can have a huge state space of choices. It becomes a mess for me. Right? If you don't know that, go back and check a little bit. So, so in this particular case, you can compute all these numbers, but so you can compute all these, crank out these numbers and get all this stuff, right? And you say the probability of uh, my accepting, given if I know that somebody has an online account and has a credit card, is 0.0978 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, A is the probability of accepting, C is the probability of having a credit card, D is the probability of, uh, is the event, these are all events. A is the event of acceptance, B is the, e, C is the event that I have a credit card, and uh, a credit card, and then D is the uh, event that I actually have an online account. You mean how did it come? That's Bayes theorem. Okay. This is Bayes theorem. Yeah. And except every time I have a B, I've replaced it by C comma D. Okay. So in other words, the event B is one joint event of having a credit card account and also having uh, an online account. Yeah. I'm just so I'm just saying all I'm doing is replacing B by the the compound event C comma D. That's all. Nothing more. Ah, so yeah, yeah. So the probability of B is the total uh, number of people who accepted it uh, is uh, include whether yeah here people who if I look at the bottom right uh, I yeah so let's write this out. This probability of C given D is equal to probability of C given D given A. Uh, what's the thing? Yeah. Uh, into probability of A plus probability of C, A equals 0, into probability of C comma D given A equals 1, into probability of A equals 1. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's, that's fine. I'm yeah. just confused why, um, why it's true in the negative state. Why is that? Ah, okay. Okay, numbers you figure out. I mean, I... I mean, like, the, the two of the is the number of people accepted. It's okay. Well, let's go back. Okay, let's see, 286 here. I, as I said, I didn't check the, uh, okay. Let's see here, so okay, uh, let's see. You see why, I see, 50 by 286. 286 must be a summation of, uh, of, uh, huh? Let's see, uh, summation of 129 and 71, that's 200 and, uh, sorry, that's exactly 200 and 50 and 36, right? Yeah, right. So whereas here you feel uh, you're saying that this is the total. Okay, if I just look at probability of C D, right? Yeah. It's the people who have I C. So you're asking why am I? Okay, let's look at it. So let's look at 
people seven uh, this summation is those people who have a credit card who are either uh, so I'm, I'm adding up everybody who is online or not online and who does not have a credit card if I add these things up I'm adding those people who are online or not online and do not have a credit card yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be the number of people with a credit card and online account, whether or not they accept it. Let's look at it. Okay. People who are uh, credit card, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The 206 is who are the provinces and because it's uh, equal one. So people who accept the credit card. Yeah, exactly. So what you are doing is it's the two factors. Get the condition of probability, right? Yeah. So it's not a proper, uh, it's condition or a way that causes a few Does acceptance equals one is conditional that A equals one? Yeah. So it's one is a probability. That's why you have to uh, obtain the, the equation that is the probability of C and D, right? So the, the second term is probability accepting is one, right? Which is we counted 286 and then we added up all the other terms, right? Yeah. No, that, that was done finally. It gives you just the. Uh, okay, because okay, so maybe let's do it often. I'm not quite sure what the issue is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so the only issue is that there's so many of these choices, and here it's only two of them, but if we've got 10 of them, then you end up with so many combinations, right? So it gives a, becomes a headache. So, how do you handle that? Uh, so, the, uh, so, you know, so the issue also is. Will you be getting data points with all these uh, possibilities? May or may not, right? Or you may have very few data points corresponding to each of these possibilities, right? So why do I need to look at all of them? That's the question. And so it transpires that if I can assume that, you know, for example, if I look at this one, right? It's the credit card account zero. Uh, it's online, yes. Credit card, yes, right? So if I want to predict this, for example, then if I just assume that instead of looking at this entire messy table, I just look at the marginals, right? So, so I replace this, which is the joint distribution of credit card being, uh, somebody having a credit card and being online, uh, given the fact they're accepting, I'm going to replace that with the marginal distribution product. Uh, now, have all of you considered the fact that joint distribution is not the same uh, as multiplying the marginal distributions? Is some idea you're familiar with? No. Ah, okay, okay. We need uh, some probability. Uh, well, let me, let me give you a simple, let me, give me a minute to think of some simple example. Yeah. If you say, what is the probability that I'm married and I have an income over a million dollars? Right? Do you think the, uh, or say I have a, uh, yeah, just say that, right? Do you think the two uh, events are related or do you think they're unrelated? Unrelated. Okay. Depends, right? It could be. Hey, you know what? I'll give you an example. Say I'm a consultant. You know, as a consultant, you can make a million dollars a year. But then maybe I need to have a wife who stays at home, take care of everything else. I mean, that's an extreme case, right? Or I'm a wife and the husband has to take care of everybody at home, right? Whatever the way it is, right? But anyway, but let's think of something else. Uh, if I think of the fact I have my, my, my height, ah, uh, uh, visitors have come in. Ah, you need to give me a minute. By the way, hi, John, how are you? Welcome. Hi, Chef. Our visitors have just arrived. Come on in. Ah, by the way, do you need a parking problem? You need to scratch off the right. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, sure. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Come on in. Come take a seat. Come. Give me a minute to wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So 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 the thing is, if uh, think of uh, my weight. Okay. If I say Napoleon. Okay. Let's think of Napoleon. I say my height is what five uh, five feet or maybe sub five feet. I don't know. And I'm a conqueror of the earth, right? Then are the two necessarily related? Maybe because some people feel he had to overcompensate for his uh, height, right? But under usual conditions, the two are independent variables, right? 
You, so the probability of my being a world conqueror, which is pretty low anyway, <laughs> uh, times uh, uh, the fact that my height, are, uh, I have no dependency, right? So I can just, the product can be fine. But if I say my height is six feet and my weight is 200 pounds, that is more likely to be related, right? Because some sort of a reasonable, uh, comp uh, I mean, some people are uh, bone de density heavy and others are more <laughs> mass heavy. But roughly speaking, there's a greater dependence between height and weight, right? So I can't just take the product of my probability of some probability of my uh, height and probability of my weight and just say it's exactly the same as the probability of my having a certain weight and a certain height because there's more dependency in that case, right? So it doesn't factor off, right? So, so but here in naive Bayes, we are assuming that you factor because the computational difficulty is so much, we just want to factor these things, right? And I'm just showing you a, a two by two case, but you can have lots of variables in which case uh, they think of 100 variables or 100 features or something, right? So this is the uh, dependency we are assuming that whether I own a credit card and being, or I have an online account are independent. But typically, if I'm a credit card owner, I'm likely to be a little tech savvy. I'm more likely to own an online account, right? But, uh, but the interesting part of it is knife base and uh, it was empirically found to work well and then I've given you the theoretical reason uh, where under some set of circumstances it works well. Uh, you know, knife base works pretty well. That's the bottom line. Everybody with me? Everybody a little bit more comfortable? Pancha, you're fine? No worries, no problems, all's well? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so in this particular case, if I think of uh, computing this expression, right, we've got all these messy looking expressions, right? So, so instead of doing all these complicated expressions, I, I'll just take a simple product of the type I mentioned earlier. So instead of doing the joint uh, probability, I'll just take each of these pieces, I'll estimate each of these marginals and take the product and fill in a lot of these tables, right? So I need to fill in these tables to do my computation, right, for this base update, right? Because the whole point of classification is for classification, I need to compute all these joint densities because I have a relative ratio of these joint densities, right? But joint densities are a pain to compute. But if we assume that the product of marginals, life becomes simple. So clear? So again, let's remember everything. So we can look at these details a little bit offline now that we have a guest here. But there are three key points. First of all, any classifier is a ratio of probabilities. That conditional on the data, you belong to one class or the other, right? It's a ratio. So think of these as scoring functions. Now, if the ratio has to be greater than one, then I assign the class to one. Or plus, right? Now, I take logs. If I take a log, then this ratio has to be greater than zero. So that's step one. But these probability expressions are often joint distributions, or joint density functions, which is a mess. We are saying that in naive base, we can replace them by independent uh, probabilities and take the product of all these things together, which we know is highly flaky and not valid. But we've sort of proved, actually, under some conditions, it works well. And we are sort of giving you some examples to check it out. Looks good? So what I would suggest is maybe we should break now since we have our visitors. And if necessary, after class is done, I can uh, complete uh, uh, the example so that if you have questions and doubts, I can go through it. Looks reasonable? Yeah. So, so now what I was hoping to do, we are a little behind because we're taking a full couple of classes to cover naive ways. Uh, but I was hoping to cover search engines. Uh, so that's one thing uh, we have. And then we have other methods to cover for classification. Uh, we've got decision trees. We've also got um, um, support vector machines, but we'll, I guess, pace it out, okay? But I'm going to stop at this point of time and maybe take a short uh, two, three minute break, a uh, bio break, and then we'll have time to introduce our visitors. And, uh, you know, they'll talk about a very nice problem, but I'll hold off uh, on the introductions till you come back to class, okay? Two, three minutes. So that's about uh, maybe in about five minutes. Okay. Hey, John, thank you for coming down. Much no appreciated. Right. Uh, okay, very good. <laughs> hey, Shiv, good. No problems. Uh, you could just park on the street. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Have power limit yeah, okay. You need more coins? No, no. Wait just now. Yeah, okay. By the way, say hello to uh, Professor Ray Larson. Uh, uh, this is uh, John Martin. Okay, this is Shiv. We'll make the full round of introductions in a couple of minutes. I'll be back in just a
Yeah, yeah, you want to get set up? Uh, shall, uh, shall I? Let me just. Uh, This little yeah. Uh -huh. Good. And you mix it in the last lecture, and this one you put them up on the web. Oh, uh, I
So, um, yeah, so, so surveys w w was a very old way of doing things, but, you know, it's really pretty amazing. If you do it correctly, you talk to 100 people, the right 100 people ask the right question, you predict a national election, you know, involving a quarter of a billion people. So the key thing there is, though, to do it right and to do it in a way that doesn't annoy people. So we put together a system that um, blended web analytics and survey research. Um, and so what that means, you know, in a practical sense is we drop a tag on a website uh, and we um, ingest a whole, passively a whole bunch of um, what we might call behavioral data, similar to what you'd see out of Google Analytics or Omniture. How many pages were visited, where did people come from, what did they do, how long did they stay, et cetera, et cetera. And we use that to drive um, automated survey research. And it turns out to be a really nice combination. You get all of these efficiency benefits where uh, you know, we built control systems so we can figure out um, how many people we need to invite to particular surveys to meet particular quotas in particular ways. Um, and it was robust against big swings in traffic, that type of thing. Um, but it also allows us to do these things, which are uh, interesting in the field of market research, which are things like non-bias uh, response, uh, non-response bias analysis. So looking at the difference between the people who responded to a piece of research and the people that didn't. And we're able to do that because we have these two populations, the exhaustive population of a website and the population of people that we surveyed. Um, so we're, as I said, we're working with two, three dozen major customers, you know, big customers like CNN and Time Warner and uh, Yahoo soon and uh, um, um, those, kind, those types of guys, and big ad, ad networks like Federated Media and Halogen and Technorati. And, um, so we, we deal with a lot of traffic for a small company. We have um, 5 billion, 6 billion on average monthly page views. Um, we have a few million full legitimate responses in the database, which, which blows out to 35 million or so data points. And that means, we, that means these are data points about particular individuals um, covering everything from demographics, attitudes, values, and behavioral elements, uh, what type of a visitor they were. Um, so we have a lot of data. Um, and I guess our big, the big, for the past three years, we've been a market research company, a web analytics company, selling market research and web analytics. And now that we've got this big fat database, um, and guys like Shiv come along and see it and say, we should use this to target advertising. And not in a soft way, but in a very direct way. Use it to make predictions about individuals that come across a website and, uh, and figure out what ads or what content in general to show them. So that's the big overriding problem that we're trying to solve. And so to describe what the ingredients that we've got to work with, we start off with a website. This is one of our customers, everydayhealth.com. Um, we uh, tag it, obviously, just a little JavaScript tag so that we can record everything that comes along. Um, and then we, um, in a way that I won't describe, but we randomly recruit a small subset of visitors to take part in a survey. And we do this in a, a way that's broadly representative. Um, and so we know very specific things about particular individuals. We know that the person that landed here on Monday at 9 a.m. and was looking at a recipe for carrot cake was female in this age group, and they shop at Macy's, and they buy organic food, and you know, 20 other things, behavioral and, and demographic. Much of it self-reported. Um, and then what we do is just using basic uh, statistics, just really you know, first-year stats, we project this across the whole population to within um, a, a given margin of error. So we know that the website as a whole has this 70-30 split in gender. It has this kind of three-way split in terms of income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how a lot of these big websites um, go and tell their advertisers this is the composition of our audience. So all pretty straightforward. But then we start to take advantage of the web analytics data that we have. So we start to segment the website in, all, in a variety of different ways. So we end up, end up with this um, multi-dimensional uh, cube, essentially. So we're saying that um, these, these segments might be subsites. So if this was ESPN, this might be the NBA uh, subsite. This may be the, um, uh, the, the golf subsite. This may be the NHL, et cetera, et cetera. Or it might be time. So it might be 9 AM, 10 AM. It might be business hours, non-business hours. Um, it could be segmented by type of visitor. So are you a regular visitor, or is this a, are you a first-time visitor? So we segment. Um, the website in a number of different ways. And then we start to um, look for interesting correlations. So we start to say, all right, it looks like 
everybody that fell into this bucket here um, tended to skew higher than average for income, or tended to skew higher, tended to be more likely to own an SUV versus a hatchback, that type of thing. And so now, now what we've got is for any given demographic that you want to ask for, we can tell you where you're most likely to find it on the website, where the incidence of those people um, is highest. And so um, even though the website was a 70-30 split, um, we know that, and this might be, again, 9 a.m. on the recipe section, that it's uh, almost 90% female. So we've almost got a perfect chance of grabbing a female from this particular section. So some of these are really obvious. You know, we find things like um, women with children versus um, women without children tend to visit particular types of websites at different times of day. It's really obvious. But then there are less obvious things. You know, we find very strong correlations between income and uh, the operating system that you use. Uh, education and operating system, um, the web browser that you use, all these different bizarre things. Some of them really obvious, some of them just inexplicable. Um, but with enough Hadoop and MapReduce and so on running, we can, we can figure all these out. So what we're trying to do is apply these to advertising. So if we want a particular group, we'll say to a, web, we'll say to a website, um, you know, we'll, uh, if you're interested in these um, high-income women, this is where you'll find them. Um, and not only that, we'll track them, and we'll be able to find them off-site as well. So, you know, a website that starts out as 70-30 or 50-50 male-female, we can find these really high skew pockets of a particular gender, and we can um, show them content on-site, and then we can also follow them off-site by using cookies and so on and so forth. And so, from our customer's perspective, uh, sorry, they end up with... Um, they end up with, with, an, with an opportunity to sell an ad to a particular demographic um, that they couldn't before. Um, and not only do we sell it on their site, so instead of being able to sell 100,000 impressions to this person, we, we double it or triple it. We also um, find them off-site. So when they're visiting Huffington Post or Yahoo or something, um, they're carrying around this little cookie that we've identified them. Uh, so that's the first phase of what we're doing. And then the second phase is to... Um, is to try to extend this notion and instead of um, just targeting the particular individuals that we've made predictions about, we'll build look-alike models um, so that uh, we can extend that even further. So um, the example here is, uh, if this is our original visitor who is very high skew for a particular demographic, these are other websites um, that we have some amount of data on we're able to take certain behaviors and certain demographics and make some, um, some claim with, su with certain statistical rigor that this person, uh, you know, across these dimensions um, is essentially the same as this person as far as the advertiser or the content producer is concerned. And so this is yet again another opportunity. And the way that this bottoms out from a business perspective is if you're ESPN, you know, and you've got, um, you've got, a million impressions against uh, you know on your final four page on on a weekend um, you can sell those for huge dollars um, but you can also find those exact same people off-site and uh, provide your salespeople with with uh, more opportunities to sell sorry to get a little businessy here but I'm just trying to provide the motivation for what we're doing here so um, very quickly from a data flow perspective we start out with um, our uh, survey data and passively collected behavioral data. We end up throwing these uh, into these, or organizing them into these things that we call segments. So it might be high income mothers or it might be in market reno home renovators, something like that. And these are each described by, by certain demography. Um, we throw it into, uh, into our analysis engine which right now is all Hadoop and MapReduce um, and perhaps soon machine learning. Uh, and we look for these interesting correlations where they're available. Uh, we generate targeting signatures. And uh, then we feed it into a targeting engine, which is typically ends up, ends up being fed into an ad server. So um, when you land on a website on a particular page at a particular time, we'll make a prediction about you in real time. And we'll tell the ad server. And the ad server makes a decision about whether to, um, whether to advertise against you or not. Uh, our system is really complicated. I'm not going to talk about it, except to say that um, the, 
the interesting thing for you guys, I, I guess, um, is around this uh, big Hadoop cluster that we're building. So we, um, we started out just from a software perspective, you know, this all lived uh, within a single MySQL database. Um, we quickly exhausted that and moved to much more scalable uh, uh, formats, raw logging, that type of thing. Um, we're now at the point where Shiv and Shiv's team is building out a big um, dynamic uh, MapReduce cluster on Amazon so that we can spin up machines and spin down machines whenever we feel the, the urge to go and look for interesting correlations or to do some counting of some sort. Um, yes, anything to add, Shiv? No. Not particularly, except um, yeah, I guess I do want to say that uh, don't we have more of a Hadoop uh, cluster which is uh, doing like the regular analysis, but we're also planning to use um, um, a machine learning package by the name of Mahout. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mahout. I'm just hoping that someone has heard of Mahout, especially it might have been mentioned in the context of a different project. So we're planning to leverage that for machine learning um, uh, in, a, in a large scale system. So we've, we've, we've got a few problems that we're trying to solve right now and looking for help solving them. I mean, again, at a high level, the situation is we've got this big database. Um, it's, half of it is full of behavioral information, the other half full of um, demography, psychographics, attitudes, values, etc. cetera. Um, and we're trying to mix these two databases uh, in various ways to make uh, predictions about individuals that we've never seen before based upon their behavior or where, they, where, the, where we find them. Um, and also to, um, to do things like uh, research, market research without market research. So if we've, um, one of the things that we've played with is for any given person that lands on a website and that we survey, we might ask them 10 to 20 questions. Um, there are ways in which you can do um, correlation analysis, principal component analysis, and you can figure out, all right, if this person, this person's male and lives in Berkeley and whatever, 60% likelihood they're going to drive a Prius, for example, right? And so there's no point asking them the Prius question if 60% is good enough for us. Um, and so we end up, um, what we hope is that at the end, we end up with um, asking all of these, what might be seemingly odd questions, but are questions that um, are very um, determinant of um, various other demographic or psychographic attributes. Um, and so we've got the, the one big, uh, I guess it's the one big project, but the, the, perhaps the two big projects that we're looking at, uh, uh, at working on right now. One is figuring out how we build lookalike audiences from all this data. Um, and that just means um, if we've identified a, a population that we know something about and we have a whole bunch of data on another population, how do we find the people that are best match? Um, and that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And we talk about it in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, we're probably going too far into the weeds here, but the, 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 the second problem um, is, uh, I guess, an optimization problem, is this survey problem, looking at predicting people's responses to survey questions before they've been asked. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's crowd science. That's the big fat database that we have, and they're the problems that we're trying to solve right now. Um, and we've got a really nice MapReduce playground on which to play. So. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's a great opportunity because uh, it's a real fun problem uh, to put to work all the things we've learned so far and the things we haven't learned. Uh, basically, uh, you know, this whole issue of uh, is there any uh, information, uh, information theory here? Oh, information theory? Yeah, yeah. We have somebody uh, which is, um, I don't get the name wrong. Jenny. Jenny. Jenny is doing a PhD in information theory. She's a fourth year student. So in terms of active learning, right, what is the most informative data point you may want to look for? And what is the non-informative data point, right? That's this question of uh, should we be asking this question or not, right? So, so I, I think each of you probably have backgrounds, uh, which uh, I know the scientists should be you've already shared a bit, so they know, but I think all of you, it's just an amazingly rich set of problems, uh, I think, to get to work on. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, John, you may like to get a little bit of a flavor for the class, I think, because then when, when they start asking sure. questions, you'll know where the questions are coming from. So that's right. welcome all of you to ask questions and engage. But maybe each of you very quickly want to give a couple of sentences about yourself and what you do. So, uh, I'm 
Interesting. And you work on their... I, I, actually, I work on business objects, so I okay. work more, more on the reporting side. But yeah, they have a beautiful, big, fat database there. That's interesting. <laughs> They're a good team. Is that down in Mountain View? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also a second year master's student at the School of Information. Um, I come from a consulting background, but I actually was a virtual undergrad in industrial engineering and operations research as well. Got sucked into software. She actually just He and his advisor have been looking at together for the past year. Uh, how do you predict uh, earthquakes? So the active learning of implementing data points has a uh, relationship. So when you have earthquakes, they build models. So how do you know which of these models are applicable to something right. new, and where are the gaps, and where should we be building new models? So it's the same as your active learning problem. Yeah. Interesting. Hi, uh, my name is Sanat. I am a third year PhD student in uh, operations research. And my research um, areas involve the So, no job at Enron, I guess. <laughs> oh. Oh. I'm Melissa. I'm also a second year student in industrial engineering and operations research. Um, and my research right now is on robotic grasping of uncertainty. Is that grasping as in yeah. grasping? <laughs> okay. yeah. She grasps quickly, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered whether it was literal or not. <laughs> my name is Akshay. I'm a fourth year undergrad in uh, EATS. Uh, my research is in currently using uh, sort of predictive models and crowdsourcing to do data entry. And uh, prior to that, I worked on a project building a search engine for database schemas. Hmm. And I also work part time for a startup doing web dev and SPEC. Interesting. Crowdsourcing for data entry. Uh, my name is Pranava. Um, I'm currently a third year under IU, undergrad IUR major here. Uh, before I took some courses, I took a lot of computer sciences. He is a little modest mentioning that uh, my graduate course, as an undergrad, he got an A course, the only one actually. My name is Leon Dyna. I'm uh, a first year grad, uh, first year PhD student uh, under the uh, Azure Cloud for Grant. Thank you. And uh, as an act, I, I just work with the uh, shape. Yeah, actually, you met him before, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs>
I should have just said that line. You know? <laughs> yeah, leave me hanging. Shit, <laughs> 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 sorry. Good. It's an artist meme. Like, hey, look, people don't know. I know very well at blank code. I don't recognize them. So it's good to see other people. I was just trying to make you feel good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We did, yes. And this is my fourth year at the PhD. I'm a grad student in Santa Cruz. And I've been working a little bit on graphic modeling and Bayesian statistics in text and some of our biases analysis in computational annotation. So those are the main two things I've been working on. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, my name is Anna Caballero. I'm also a fourth year So now when people ask you questions, you know where they're coming from. That's the, that's what I just want to give you a little bit of flavor for the class and for the people. Okay, okay. so folks now, uh, Joshua and, and John Chips, so I'm going to keep quite a little bit and let you ask any questions, doubts, and just put for us. Can I just ask two more questions about the company? Sure. And a few bit about those. Um, one is, um, I read a lot of LinkedIn and I saw that there's several Jackson illegal cases that have been Yeah. So today, today we have nothing, um, but we can turn it on at any time, um, and we will. Um, and so, yeah. So we get asked this by investors and, and customers sometimes because there's you know there's bills in front of Congress right now, which would essentially wipe third-party cookies from the face of the earth. So. Yeah, so I think it would be absolutely horrible for the internet, I mean, if, if we lost third party cookies. For crowd science, it's kind of, we'd actually, we'd benefit greatly because there are whole portions of the industry that would, would cease to exist, that absolutely require third party cookies and they just, there's, there's no, there, there's no uh, alternative. And so it's a nuclear, it's a nuclear outcome but we'd be kind of this cockroach walking around. So it would be, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a sick thought, but it's bad for the internet, good for crowd science. It would mean that we would give up a lot of this stuff, no question. But we'd go back to much more simpler times, you know. And we, we would start doing things like, um, even though there's no direct connection between a person on this website and another, we'd just start making more and more correlations and more and more we'd look for more things on each website, go deeper on each website, and try to m m model people. Um, so yeah. I think I, I was reading even about cross-site cookies, you can use things like a user's browser, like a hash on their browser thing to make it pretty much track them. Yes. There, there seems to always be ways to get around the people. So it's funny you should mention that. We have a fingerprinting technology. Um, uh, and uh, and it works pretty well. So it it's. It's the kind of classic way of doing it. It's not cl a classic way of doing it, but it's the known way of doing it to the 37 people that know how to do it. Um, and we, we essentially just throw all of these uh, passively ingested, very, you know, your brow the version of Flash that you're using, the fonts that you've got installed, that type of thing. You, you can pick, I don't know, I think we pick 20, 25, 30 of them, throw and just do a simple hash. And um, we end up getting surprisingly good results. We get something like, I think it's like 80%, 85% um, uniqueness or unique uh, results. So you have like this, it ranges from probably 15 to 25% collisions. Um, 15 to 25% of people have colliding signatures, fingerprints. And so it's not actually useful as a cookie because uh, it's, it's either unique or it's not, it's, it gets kind of weird. But for us, we live, in, uh, we live much of the time in a statistical world. So we don't have to know everything about everybody, and we don't have to know everything even about individuals. We can just, we, we're allowed a little bit of fuzziness. So yeah, we use it in, in various different ways. One of the interesting ways that we use it, one of the types of research we do is ad effectiveness research. So we look at uh, in what ways did an ad, uh, a particular ad creative, um, affect an individual. 
and it's typically measured in terms of, you know, do you feel, are you more likely to go out and buy a Colgate toothpaste, or do you feel better about Colgate as a company, that kind of soft stuff. Um, but in order to do that, you set up test and control groups, exposed and not exposed. And so whenever you get people that are losing cookies and they've been exposed, you're contaminating this experiment. So we use fingerprinting as a backup for that. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a more behavioral type question. How do you actually motivate a user to pick a third and replace their? Yeah. So, um, we we don't really. We maybe in 300 out of a million responses, do we offer incentives, which is the typical way that the survey industry does it. Mm -hmm. um, Generally, there's been lots and lots and lots of research on research on, on why people would, would do this. Um, but generally, there are two equally strong motivating factors. Either you're getting compensated, so you're getting an Amazon gift voucher or five bucks or something, or um, you care about the topic or the person giving the survey. And so we just happen to have this, most of the time, this um, fortunate um, alignment between it, the research that we're doing would be for, on say, MTV.com, and it's for MTV. And so we, we go a little overboard in saying, hey, we're MTV, you're an MTV customer, or you know, MTV dude, and yeah, please help out MTV dude kind of thing. So, it, so we really we rely heavily, heavily on affinity, basically. If you care about the website, um, It'll, uh, you'll, enough people will, um, will respond to surveys. Um, but we, we spent lots and lots of time building this thing so that we can uh, give as few surveys as possible. So we pick and choose very carefully which, when and where we're going to get respondents from. And we get only exactly enough that we need to fill a particular statistical requirement. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're looking for some statistical difference between between uh, um, uh, men and women, as soon as we've, as soon as we've, for a particular confidence interval, as soon as we've reached that, or as soon as, as soon as we've determined that we're not, that we're not, it's not looking like there's a difference, then we stop. So we're we're we're, we're dynamic in that way. Um, but it's still a tax, no question. All the sort of smart selective learning, right? So we're doing our work. So we're doing just seeing that, I mean, given what you folks have been doing, uh, and I think given your interest in. We've heard we don't have hard data, but uh, you know, speaking to people like um, last one was the CMO of or the former CMO of Gap, you know, Gap and Banana Republic, and and he said you know, he wasn't a market research guy; he's just a marketing guy. But he said there's this dirty little secret within online retailing where um, when you give a person a survey. As long as it's a reasonable survey, the, um, their, likelihood, their dollars per transaction goes up and their likelihood to return and spend more money goes up. So, um, and you can imagine in cases where if you're on Gap.com and you're buying something and they say, hey, help us pick between next year's uh, shift dress print. I, I don't know. You buy, you buy little chunks of loyalty by doing that. And, um, so if you're clever, and we're... We don't do nearly enough to make life good for our respondents. So but when you find that that user is unwilling to give the incentive information, so do you, you, stop, you learn the user's information from the link they sent to the survey? When you find that user is unwilling to give that information? Yeah, it's surprising. Um, That's pretty scary. We never collect any um, PI, any personally identifiable information ever, no email addresses or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's amazing. In fact, the <laughs> To the extreme, where we've got we've got customers that are in the adult industry, right? Adult websites, and you would be surprised. They're some of the best performing in terms of uh, uh, response rates to surveys across our whole network. It's ridiculous. People who are on adult websites are thinking to themselves, "All right, I'll answer a twenty-question survey." And not only that, I'm not only going to push radio buttons. I'm going to fill in and give my opinion <laughs> on how, on how this thing should change. On non -adult industry N well, no, it's on about the website itself. Oh, okay. What about the adult website? Yes. Oh, I see. I see. I so, see. I don't know what it is. People, 
I mean, we make a reasonably safe environment. Everything's branded as the, as the company that we're coming for. But yeah, generally people, it's self-selecting as well, right? Because the people who are not going to give it are just not going to answer the survey. And then that's where you've got to be clever about non-response bias and that type of thing. So another question about Jim, I just want to know. Um, so if I live to that um, and I hire you, and I pay you to come in and kind of speed phone me and get people to answer surveys, you're collecting the data, right? Do you or are you allowed or would you be tempted to marry that data with the data that's the CNN? Like, can you worry that about this? Yeah, okay. We're very tempted, like, yes. Well, it's, so, so we currently we operate in two different worlds. We have um, what we call the premium world and the free world. The premium world are where these customers are paying us, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per month or per year to do research projects, and generally they own the data and retain their full rights, and we just help them. Correct. And and in the in the free world, it's just a free for all. We give you some tools for free, and you give us the data. Um, but th so that's that's a constraint under our whole business. Um, but, but the so, so it, what it means is that when we're thinking about all right, what products are we going to do? What 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 analyses are we going to spend time building? It always has to be um, conditioned by what's in it for the publisher. It had our motivation has to be aligned with the publisher, and generally it is. I mean, so we walk into um, MTV and we've been collecting data for them for the last year. And we'll have already shiv or someone will have already run a bunch of analysis on it. And we'll come in we'll, and we'll say, hey, did you guys know you have all this stuff? And we could help you with advertising or with content targeting. And so that's generally the way that it works. Um, but we're not, we retain rights to mix the data and report on it in aggregate. So we can say people that visit mm, music video websites tend to be blah. But that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't see a problem with sharing data. Like if you if you sign up for AdSense and you want to put an ad in the page, Google will just check all your like these pages and these are users that you make sure that's done like all the groups. Yes. And so like or not you look at the others, but then you look at all the pages as well. So it's good for me to be like share my data with all the companies that have yeah. publishing ads. But, but there's two so the the, the big you just to make like the Google page. I just since very before so I've done AdSense and Android. Yeah. That's very fun. Yeah. yeah, we um, we the only other wrinkle in this though is that um, you the publishers generally have, or not just publishers, but anybody who has a big website generally has two concerns. Number one, they don't want competitive info getting out. So if if your competitor, if your CNN and if NBC gets to see that your uh, this is your demographic or this is the way people, they don't want that. Um, but that's of course we don't do that. But then the other thing is that it, the advertising world now is online is being very much decoupled. So data, the information about a particular individual, is completely separate and bought separately and collected separately and and, and whatever from the actual impression on the web page. So most big ad agencies right now, when they do a big camp, when AT and T does a big campaign. What they'll do is they'll go over to a company like Blue Kai or some, some big data exchange and they'll say, all right, we want to buy the cookies of a million um, uh, college students in North America. And they'll get a million cookies and then they go to a big ad exchange and they say, we want to buy 100 million impressions against these 10 million people. And so, yeah, and so, so th this is kind of the state of the advertising world right now. And what that means is that there's a good business in generating data about individuals. Gen being a, you know, we call it a bakery, in, in having cookie bakeries, right? Um, and so now when you're CNN, your asset isn't just the ads that you can show on your page, but it's the data that you can, the cookies that you can generate about your visitors. You can, s they have, you can sell them on exchanges right now. That's a kind of an interesting concept. So the most the most sophisticated guys online are taking you know basic demographic data from here. They've got they're going they've got there's some companies who will mix offline data. Say the fact that you've um, filled out a prescription for uh, an anti-anxiety drug, and they'll overlay those, and then they'll go and buy. So you'll end up on you know Yahoo Finance, and you'll get an ad 
that's highly targeted that costs people, you know, 50 cents, a buck just for a single impression to sell you that but anxiety. They probably have customers for $100 worth or something. Yes. Yeah. So. So, so this is a bit like, it's a little different from, you know, I've been hearing this concept of deep web. That is, when you do ads, you know, in other words, when you do travelocity and others, right, you go to the directly to the page when people are looking for certain fl flights and fares, right? So there's a deep web sort of thing. So I'm trying to just think a little bit about what you have. It's sort of a little variant of that, I think, right? What you're articulating just now. Yeah. yeah different variants. I think it's more a combination of opposed to just getting deeper, I think. Yeah. And kayak, you know, kayak.com. Kind yeah, of, those were the they that. were the first big guys that started making money off just selling, selling the fact that you were an individual who had searched for a first class ticket to Paris, which is a bizarre concept because you you, you think all right I'm kayak my business pri my primary business is selling airfares, and here's a customer who is a hot customer this guy just did three searches for first class tickets to Paris, he didn't buy on my website. So instead of trying to advertise to him and pull him back, you just say, screw it. I'll sell that information to Expedia or to United Airlines. Mm -hmm. That's a tough calculus to make as a business. Mm -hmm. and, so, and the same thing will be true for our customers. When we go to CNN and we say, you know, you guys have this huge population of um, C-level executives, uh, they've got a choice. Do they sell? the data so that other people can advertise to them or do they sell them to their advertisers themselves? It's, 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 an, it's an interesting time. Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, I think, sorry, I have one more question about this last five questions. I'm interested in, but meanwhile, anybody else, any other questions? Uh, I have one question, for, actually, for you. <laughs> Was the, is there, where is the obvious application of um, Bayesian techniques in here? If if uh, any. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, well, the whole idea in, in this kind of, in this branch of statistics, I think, is that uh, you sort of made your parameters to be random variables fundamentally. So how is that helpful? Well, that is helpful because typically you assume that you have tons and tons of data and you fit your parameters uh, very well. but it turns out that in practice that's, that is almost never the case. You have data coming in uh, and sequentially or things like that. I mean, it depends on how aggregated you want your estimates. Right. That's when you have this lack of data flowing, sparsity and things like that. So when you have that sparsity, you either, I mean, you could, you could say, okay, forget it. I'm not able to, I mean, at this point of in time, I need more data to come up with that reasonable estimation of this uh, quantity, so I will wait for more data. That's my choice, if you, uh, I mean, if you have the chance to do that. But some problems you need to, I mean, you need to say something, you need to predict something, and simply you don't have enough data to do so. Yeah. So then that's how these uh, techniques help you, because under some assumptions, you could, I mean, you could assume that there are some relationships between uh, this estimate and other estimate that you have more data. So the beauty of these st statistics is that they help you to actually spread the probability mass if you wish. Right. So then uh, you have that with few data, you can make reasonable predictions. Right. And then you can, I mean, you can have a better uh, predictive model. And of course, you could, also, you could also have some sense of how confident you are about that prediction. Right. And also, it's very helpful, I mean, as I told you, I think that the biggest, uh, I mean, the most helpful part is that it helps you essentially uh, gather some knowledge from, the, from all the data and give you, help you to improve your estimation when you have very little data. Right. That's a more pretty high level right. philosophical view, I think. But also practical computation. No, I'm right here for user behavior models. Um, I see that as uh, applicable because if it's a different from expected behavior, that, we don't have enough points to. That's a, I mean, if we, I mean, for instance, in that, part, in that particular application, I mean, users typically, I mean, typically are very sparse, 
you have the little, little knowledge of the user, and you are learning and you are getting information from the user as you are interacting with it with him. So then the question is, how can I say something? How can I target better the user, for instance, in this, given that my objective is to target better the user? Right. So either, I mean, as I told you, you could say, OK, I don't know anything specific about the user. So I'm going gonna to wait until I have no information. But typically, that's not, I mean, that's not what you want. You want to get knowledge from the crowd and put it there. So another way is to say, OK, let's try to group the users, like clusters. Clusters, yeah. And share that information, yep. which is also fine. But uh, if you think of, I mean, something in between is like, OK, these people are more uh, similar to these. These are less similar to, to the others. So if you had some, if that is model driven, in terms of this model can tell me how, how and how much, to be a few words, if this model can give me some estimate of given the other users, this is going to happen with this one, then that is very helpful. Right. So that's what you, you could, in terms of user uh, modeling, or user behavior modeling, I think that's how the sort of statistics could help you. Because for instance, if you had some estimate, I mean, and uh, this philosophy of making parameters random variables helps you because you could have prior knowledge of the user, then when you see more data, you have a posterior, which is nothing more than yeah. you are refining your estimate, your estimations, then that posterior became, becomes a prior for the next time you collect more data. So some, so I mean, in the end, if you had infinite amount of data, you will get the same estimation. Uh, if you were not patient. Right, right, right. But in between is where this is helpful. Right. So, so I guess there are two things. One is when you look at similarity of people, you may have missing data. But if you really want to consolidate the histories that you have seen, how do you consolidate the history in an efficient manner? You build a Bayesian trial. And then you've got the different features, and maybe features are missing on some data points. Yes. Again, you use Bayesian model to fill that in the dynamic Bayesian recommenders. Those are the two pieces I think. Right. For instance, you could you could have a user. Think of we can define ten groups, just to say a number. So we could have ten groups. So then we have users. So we can figure out whether these users is more. Uh, I mean, then we have this notion of groups generating users. Then those users will. What you had at use at group level, you would have an aggregate measure of yep. that use of those users, which is also helpful if you want to interpret that. Group. But. The beauty is that when you have a new user, for instance, coming in that you don't know where this user, this user should be, just by trying to, given some features or given the data that you have, you could try to predict what this user should fit. So you will get some probability mass from the group, but also some probability mass by the user. Individual, yeah. So then you have this combination of the two that is model driven. Yeah. So I think that the, yeah, the most beautiful part is that it's model driven. Yeah. I, I think but that also goes to questions. So when you want to ask questions, you're asking if I want to target the people at different levels or different questions, where is my gap? Then in a hierarchical fashion, you can figure out, is it in the space of five questions that yes. I don't have enough? Is it on this specific question I don't have enough? So you could work at different levels of aggregation, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, that's more in terms of high level. And then I think it's been used quite widely in text. This is the most obvious application that you had a big, huge vocabulary size. Yes. And you had this uh, notion of terms being, being very frequent in a document. So, but those are extremely sparse, and how you aggregate those, and how you actually uh, segment the documents and all that is where yep. this is more helpful. Well, this is being used a lot. Okay. Uh, quick question. I guess we are now at 4 o'clock, and I guess we can take off. Uh, so, if any of you have questions, please feel free to. I'm going to chat with uh, John and Shiv, but uh, maybe we should give a, uh, them a round of applause for the thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, you know, I've